Nehemiah chapter 11, our foundational text is going to begin with verse chapter, uh, chapter 11, starting with verse 1, and let's just start with 1 and then I'll stop when appropriate. Now the leaders of the people stayed in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots for one out of ten to come and live in Jerusalem, the holy city. And while the other nine-tenths remained in their towns, the people praised all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. And these are the heads of the providences who stayed in Jerusalem. But in the villages of Judah, each lived in, on his own property in their town. The Israelite priests and Levites and temple servants and descendants of Solomon's servants, while some of the descendants of Judah and Benjamin settled in Jerusalem. Let's pause there. In chapter 11, what you're going to find is simply just an overview of what's happening. If you remember, the walls of this city that was a ghost town for at least 70 years has now been rebuilt. And then we see a great awakening in the last two chapters that we read together that there was a revival that took place and the people repented because they knew they had to get their life in order. The walls were up and it was time to get their life up and going for God. And Ezra was part of that, Nehemiah was part of that, but most importantly, God was the foundation of all of that. And then after they get the walls up, the people have rededicated, revivals took place to a degree. Then what we see in chapter 11 is it's time to bring the people in so they have a lottery. And this lottery is that 10% of those in the land could come and move in and live amongst the walls. And then what happened is it says, and then anyone who is volunteering, then you can come. Now you say, well, why wouldn't everyone want to go and live amongst the walls? Understand that what's happening is you're having to give up a lot. You're sacrificing to go and rebuild a city that had been virtually in ruin in a ghost town. You're giving up your own homeland to go and start over. And when I read that, I think about the spiritual significance of it. That God's calling us to leave what we're comfortable with. God's calling us to leave that area in which we have known a lot longer than we've known the city of God. And He is saying to us, if you will come and live amongst me, then I'm going to bless you and the people will look at you and call you a blessing. And if you read all of chapter 11, that's exactly the imagery that's being painted there. Oh, I love that. It doesn't say that it was a large printed cent. It says it was a 10%. And it reminds me that when we get to heaven, I think we're still going to have some elbow room in heaven. And do not say amen to that. Because our nature will go, amen. <laughs> no. That's sad. It's sad. It's sad when we have elbow room in this congregation on our pews. Come on. But my friends, it will be even more horrific when we get to heaven and realize that we can probably do a jig and twirl and move our hands around and not hit too many people because it says that narrow is the way to where He is calling us, but wide is the way. And many will go to the path of destruction. And so this is an imagery right here in the book of Nehemiah that not everyone is going to live amongst the walls of heaven. And here, that's what Jerusalem is being painted as. And we can look at that and see. And so it goes on in chapter 11 explaining each one of the descendants of Judah and the descendants of Benjamin. And it talks about those who came from the Levitical order and the priestly order and the gatekeepers. And it mentions all of these people in chapter 11. And you say, well, why is that even in the Bible? Why didn't they just say what you just said and sum it up? It's because God wanted to make sure these people who were leaving that familiar land would always be remembered, even if their name might be hard to pronounce. God still knew them because He created them individually. 
And then we go to chapter 12. So now we have the people who have moved back into the land, 10%, and then those who have volunteered have come back into the land and come into the walls. And then in chapter 12, you're going to find that there is actually a dedication that takes place. I can remember very vividly, and it's funny, some of the things you remember as a kid and then other things that you just forget. Sometimes it's the silly things you remember as a kid, right? Some of you probably remember things as a child better than what you remember what happened last week. But I can remember living and being in Wallace, and the big thing at that time was they were breaking ground on a place that I haven't be, hadn't been into before called Walmart. Now, I'm not talking about 10 City Walmart. Now, see, some of y'all are not old enough to know that. I'm talking about the Wallace Walmart. We were in this long, and how foolish it was, I know. But we were in this long line the day they were to open. So excited that they were opening a Walmart in Wallace. And while we were there, they had the ribbons, they had flowers, they had the mayor, they had all these things going on, the dignitaries, because that was a pretty big deal for a, that town to get a Walmart. And then what they did is they had someone there and they had possibly, if I remember correctly, this has been a few years ago, that when they cut the ribbon, they had a prayer, they had a congratulations, they did all this other kind of stuff. And then said, so now everyone, come on in and waste your money on products from China. <laughs> well, they probably didn't say that part, but that's what they were thinking. And now, if you go to that same location, I can take you virtually to the same spot that Grandma and I stood in that parking lot. And look at that building. That building now is empty. It's been a little makeover to it, but the building itself is still empty, and they've built now a, a larger facility and a place that at the time, when I was little, had nothing there, Ten City. But the reason why I even tell you that is so that you can visualize what a dedication is all about. When they're going to dedicate the walls in Jerusalem, it was a bigger deal than a Walmart coming to town. It was a big deal because why? It was a spiritual act. Many of you probably remember when this, how many of you, I don't know, if I don't want to embarrass you in bragging on how long God has allowed you to be here. How many of you remember when this building was constructed or when the fellowship hall was constructed? Any of you old enough to remember that? I remember the fellowship hall. You remember the fellowship hall being built? Oh yeah, Mr. David, they're calling you out. So. <laughs> it, 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 it is very nice to get old. I would ask this, and you don't have to answer out loud, but I would ask all you this. Do you think it was a big deal to the people living at that time that there was a new sanctuary or a new fellowship hall? There was some excitement amongst the people. Do you think so? Or do you think they showed up when the ribbon was cut and the people came in and just said, hmm, oh well, we got a new fellowship hall. Huh, we got a new sanctuary. No, there was an excitement. And even in that excitement of a ribbon cut for a retail store or excitement of retail or going now to a church or a fellowship hall, now multiply that times a million. It was the excitement of getting back into the land that God had blessed. You follow me? And so what takes place is three unique anointings in that dedication service. In chapter, I believe it's chapter 30, or chapter, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 30, it actually lists this anointing that took place at the dedication of the work that was to be undone. Now you remember, it took 52 days to rebuild the wall, right? They didn't have all those inspectors come, I'm sure. <laughs> but I promise you, it was, it was probably built a lot more sturdy than what would be built today too. 
But it says this, it says in, in chapter 12, verse 30, and I want to spend a little time just right there in that area where it talks about the dedication. After the priest and the Levites had purified themselves, they purified the people, and then they purified the gates and the wall itself. Now, if you mark your Bibles, that might be a good mark your Bible, underline it, circle the verse kind of Scripture, and I'm going to explain to you why. Nehemiah understood, just like Ezra the prophet, while this is happening, is that first and foremost, if we're going to be part of the work of God, notice the first group of people that had to be purified. It was the priest and the Levite. Now, why is that important? It's because you cannot expect the people of God to get holy if the man of God isn't holy. Now, come on now. You can't expect the people of God to come to Sunday school if the man of God won't go to Sunday school. You can't expect the people of God to pray if the man of God won't pray. The problem we have now is we've got too many churches that are being led by cruise directors instead of having battleships led by spiritual captains. Amen. That's what we need. We need to understand that we are not some cruise ship where our needs are being met and waited upon by the captain and, and those who are on staff. We're in a battle, friends, and in that battle, it requires all of us to be ready. But if the captain is spiritually asleep, then don't expect the soldiers to be awake. I know this because it even tells us this principle in the epistle of James, the letter of James chapter 1 verse uh, 19 through 27. I want to read that to you and listen how important it is that, that God's leaders get purified before they start trying to see the people be led to God. Now let me read it to you. My dearly beloved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. For man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourself of all moral filth. And notice what he says. He is saying the leaders must rid themselves of moral filth and evil humbly receiving the implanted word which is able to save you. What saves me is not my works. What saves me is the word of God who has redeemed me, Christ's gift to me. And it says, verse 22, but be doers of the word and don't just listen about it. Hearers, deceiving yourself because if anyone is a hearer of the word and does not do it, he's like a man who is looking at his own face in the mirror for he looks at himself and he goes away and immediately he forgets what kind of man he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and preserves in it and is not forgetful here, but one who does good works. Notice it didn't say he was saved by these, but because the word is in him, he's going to do it. This person will be blessed in what he does. Thank you, Lord. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, then his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Pure and un the foul religion before our God and Father is this, to look after the orphans, the widows in their distress, and it keeps oneself unstained by the world. The priests and the Levites purified themselves. What did that look like? In ancient days it meant they washed their clothes. They were bathed. They were took time to set themselves apart for this event. You that are Sunday school teachers, take time to be in that lesson before you present that lesson. Come on. Pastors that don't spend time in the Word, you can tell if it's just up there being what man's gifts 
then you can tell that God's not in it. It's just a man-made thing. But here what we see, it says that you've got to have the Word in you before the Word can come out of you. Amen. The sad thing. And I, 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 I thought about doing this and I said no because I don't want to uh, just really hammer this down. I just want you to think about it. But you could probably go and research this. All the ministers who have failed their ministry. Now think of that. I guarantee you, in your lifetime, you probably personally know of a minister who has failed his ministry. But ultimately the sad thing, he has failed God. You see, many are called, but few are actually chosen. But you see, it's important that we understand that before we get up before man, we need to get down with God. I didn't have that written down and didn't plan to say it, so obviously you needed to hear it and say that I. Before I get up before man, I need to get down with God. Let's get some shirts printed up with that on it. <laughs> Glory. The point I'm getting at is that we have so many ministers today and even Baptist ministers that are more worried about filling the church than they are about filling heaven. Well, I didn't even have that written down. It just came to me. Thank you, Lord. I tell you, there's another t-shirt you can sell. The point is, is that stop trying to get everyone else right when you're wrong. Right? Your kids can see it. Your wife or your husband can see it. Most importantly, even if they can't, God sees it. So what do we say? The first thing is, is that the priests and the Levites, the Levites were in control of the worship service. I put a little tidbit in here for you in your bulletin. There was at least 22 different musical instruments mentioned in the Bible. Some of us say we love hearing the piano, and I love hearing it also. But wouldn't you love to hear the piano? And would you love to also hear the piano and, and hear 21 other instruments? Yes. Come on now, wouldn't that be awesome? Amen. Little drummer boy up here, the flute player, you know, could see Elton with that big, that big guitar thing, you know, it stands about as tall as he is and about as wide as I am. I mean, you know, whatever that's called. It's the bass. Oh, it's all about the bass, isn't it? Yeah. It's the bass. That's Elton's instrument. The point is, is can you just imagine if God was to bring that in? I want to tell you something. When we listen to music, it needs to be purified as well. Yeah. Yes. Let me say this to you. There's a song I love and I, I've actually sung it in church. Not this church, but I've sung it in church when I was young and still thought I could sing. And David Conner does a good job with singing it as well, but it's The Anchor Holes by Ray Balls. Love that song. But you know what I've got to realize when I listen to that, even though Ray Bolts has now walked away from the faith, the minister who wrote the song, the words mean more than what the person who was singing it. But what has happened is the person who is singing it because of the lifestyle that they're living now when we hear that song, the first thing we think of is the polluted life of the singer and not the righteousness of the preacher who wrote the song, right? You see, that's, we've got to be right, folks. When we get behind the piano, when we get behind the trumpet, when we get behind the banjo, when you get behind the spoons, be right with God. Amen? Amen. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Number two. We see, secondly, what do I have for you in the notes? I have that the second group that had to be purified once the leader has done that is the people. Now I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to me. It's not just selecting one or two of us out. The people had to be. And where do we see that? In verse 30 it says that the priests were to be purified themselves. The Levites, which were worship leaders. And then it says then they purified the people. Turn with me if you will, if you still have your Bibles open to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If you've got the Genesis, you've not got far enough. 
First John, you got a revelation. You're mighty close. You're on fire, but you've gone too far. First John, chapter one, verse nine. You're going to love this verse. I guarantee you. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What happens there? You think about the sin right now that if it were played on the screen up here, that you had committed. The sin that no one knew that you went down to South Carolina to do. The sin that you went out in the woods to do. The sin that you did when no one was around. And we said, but guess what, brother? Guess what, sister? We've been following you with a secret camera crew. And we're going to play it right now on the screen. How many of you would sit there and say, well, that's all right then. I'll, I'll, let's, let's see this, what it has to say. Or would you be terrified of what people would think? I want to tell you today, my friends, just as bold as I can, when we confess that thing to the Lord, He is righteous to delete the tape. And to make sure that no one can get it off the tape, He will destroy it and throw it away. Amen. I said this Wednesday night and I'll say it this morning. When you stand before God right now, if you were to take your last breath, if you've asked God to forgive you of that, He has purified you, and you stand before the Almighty, guess what happens? If you were to try to bring up and say, God, please, I want to come into your glory, but please, Lord, don't hold X, Y, and Z against me. I've got good news, and the good news is this, is that God would look at you and say, what are you talking about? Amen. He doesn't remember it because He chooses not to. It says He will remember your sins no more. The devil remembers. Your friends remember. Your spouse might remember. But guess what? They will not be the one you stand before on judgment day. God remembers not. Why? Because when He looks at you, He sees where you've been purified. He looks at you and sees where you have been sanctified. He looks at you and He sees where you have been justified. He looks at you and He sees where you are His child because of the work of His only Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I love that. And the reason why it is so powerful is because we have all fallen short. Amen. You look down your religious nose at somebody because they committed a different sin to you. God does not have a meter on sin and say that sin and this sin and that. No. When we sin, it's a, it's a sin against God. But understand, God wipes the slate clean and purifies us so we can be His people. The whole point of when we take communion and we ask God to search our hearts and forgive us that sin and let us be worthy to take communion... It's because what we are saying is that in our own nature, we are filthy, but God is clean. Amen. He is. So today I challenge you, if you're a leader, what was the thing to do? Make sure you're purified before you start trying to lead people. Secondly, if you're the people and you call yourself a, a child of God, make sure you believe in the purification and and accept what Christ has done. Stop being like the dog, the Bible says, running back to his vomit. Or the pig running back to the, the mud. Stop being that way. Last. The last thing I thought was unique. So we, we first see that the first person has got to be the priest and the Levites. Get the preacher and the, get the, preacher and the singers. Make sure they're saved. And then it says, make sure the people are right with God. But then it says something odd to me. But then when you start pulling back the layers, you realize it's not all that odd. It says next, it says, after the priests and after the Levites and after the people have been purified, it says, then purify the gates and the wall. 
the gates and the wall. Make sure that they are anointed. Why is that important? I'm glad you asked. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, it is such a small Bible verse that you can memorize it today. Believe it or not, you can memorize a new scripture. Here it is. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, Stay away from every kind of evil. Do you hear me? Paul says, stay away from every kind of evil. So what does that tell me? It tells me that there are places in this world that are not purified and that children of God should not be going into them. You say, well, pastor, how are we supposed to get the gospel into that place? How, are you really going in there to get the gospel in there? Years ago when I was pastoring up in Roseboro, I can remember going into the liquor store. And you look at me, you went into the liquor store? But I went into the liquor store because one of my deacons said that there was a lady in there, the cashier, that wanted to know more about the Lord. And every time he would go in there, he didn't know exactly what to say to her. <laughs> now, why are y'all laughing? <laughs> and so... <laughs> This is true. And so he was telling me, come on, this was Sampson County, folks. Okay? <laughs> and so he told me, he says, Pastor, if you ever go in there, told me your name, go, will you talk to her about the Lord? <laughs> I said, okay. And so I pull up in there, and I didn't know what you do when you go in a liquor store. But I went up in there, and they had all this stuff on, and you know, all this stuff that's in there, liquor. And uh, I mean, I don't know, I don't drink. And so I, I walk in there and I asked the lady, I said, Are you so and so? Yes, I am. She said, What can I help? You need help picking something out? I said, No, I said that one of my friends who has met you a few times, I assumed that he said that you were talking or it came up about the Lord. I said, you got a few moments, and I told who I was. I said, can I tell you more about the Lord? And I will tell you something. Right up there in the liquor store, talking about Jesus, <laughs> don't tell me that God can't move. <laughs> Folks, I tell you something that is so great. We won't jump drunk on what was inside of there. But there was a move of God talking about Jesus amongst all that stuff. The point I'm getting at today is that place might not have been sanctified. But I will tell you this, when that woman walked out, she was justified. <laughs> you see, God wants you to be aware that when you go in your home, you should bless God's blessings on that home. There is nothing wrong. I've had people buy new homes and say, Pastor, I want you to come over. Will you pray over this home? That what we do in here, the meals we have in here, that God would bless our dwelling place. You say, oh, that's silly. Well, don't tell that to the people in Israel because even now today they put the, the Word of God on the door frame and when they walk by, they touch it as a reminder that when we come in here, we need to keep God's Word even walking into this place. Amen. You come to the parsonage, I've got something similar to that on my door as a visual reminder that when I go in there, I'm not just coming into my home, I'm coming into the parsonage, a part of the ministry we do at Atkinson Baptist. The point I'm saying to you today is that if you're going to be holy then think about the places you're going to. I'm not as concerned about you going somewhere and losing your salvation like you would lose a child at Disney. What I'm concerned about is you going to these places and losing the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm concerned about. When I got a call years ago, and I'll wrap all of this up with this example. There was a place up in Fayetteville. Now that Fayetteville's not Sampson County, so it's a little bit more dignified, I guess. But up in Cumberland County, 
There was a place called Bottoms Up. And it was like a little bar, I guess. And I got a call that one of my men was in there and their truck was seen in there. And the person who called me was the spouse. Because he got up in there and he got a little too much to drink. And guess what she wants? She wants... No, he will not in jail. He was still in the bar. He needed to be in the doghouse. Wanted me to go right up there to Fadville. And go get the man. Oh my Lord. I drove from where I was living at up there to that bar. I prayed the whole time, Lord, don't let somebody see my car parked up there. <laughs> I realized that they won't have a Saturday night Bible study when I got to the door. I got to the door and I said, I've come to pick up so and so. And the guy looked at me and he says, well, we don't keep roster here. He says, but you're more than welcome to come on in and find him and take him out. Folks, I tell you something, I was scarred for life. <laughs> I walk in that place. Now, I'm being serious with you. I walk in that place and it's not because I wanted to go in there, but it's because there was a brother in Christ who had dishonored his wife by going in there. Played the part of a fool and now is humiliated because his pastor had to walk in there and get him and put him in the car and take him home. I will tell you this to you. To this very day, I've never brought it up to that man what I had to do. That was between him and God. On the way from there to the home, I prayed, talked to him the best I could, but never once condemned him. You see, God does that work himself. But I just thank God that someone trusted me enough to go get him out of there. The point I'm at is this. I'd have never had to got a phone call in the middle of the night to do that if the person hadn't gone into the place that was not of God. Am I right? Yes. Today I am begging you. If you're a leader, be a leader. If you're a person of God, be the person of God, man and woman. And I'm also begging you today as this is make the right decisions about the places you go. My granddaddy, I tell you this and Tanya will come on up. My granddaddy Tobin, he was so uh so uh, fuddy-duddy about things that there was a pizza place there in Wallace. And I can remember Grandpa Tobin more holier than me. And we went in there and he saw that they were serving beer. Well, this was after we'd already ordered the food. Well, he told me, he said, I hope it's good because we're not coming back here ever again. I'm like, come on, Grandpa, this is, what I mean, just because we're not drinking. But what he was, I understood now that I'm a man, I understand. Now you say, well, you can't go to the grocery store, you can't. You can't. Peter Wiggle and Clinton, when I was a little boy, used to have a sign hanging, and it said, see you at church on Sunday. The owners there, Jesse Lindsay and his brother, would never sell the first drop of alcohol in Piggly Wiggly. You go up in there now, they got a special section for wine, they got a special section for the beer, they even got a special section for everything else you can think of. Those owners are dead and gone. The children have sold it out. It's now something else. But do you see what I'm saying to you, my friends, is that what has happened? It's just like that quote I put in your bulletin. Did you see, did you see the quote from Billy Graham that was in the bulletin? What did it say? The quote that Billy Graham said in the bulletin, let, let me just read it to you just really quick. Where's the bulletin? You got a bulletin? I don't even have one up here. But let me read this to you real quick and I'll close this out. Billy Graham said, We have largely lost sight of the holiness and purity of God today. 
This is one reason why we tolerate sin so easily. We've forgotten that God is holy, and because He is holy, we are called to be holy as well. Am I okay with you today? You still love me on my birthday? Okay. If you're not saved today, will you please consider doing that? Ask Jesus to forgive you those sins that if they were up there, you'd be so ashamed of. And He'll forgive you. If you need to rededicate, maybe you just ain't like you were. Rededicate. Maybe join the church. Be baptized. I took... Time to just play a little something slow if you don't mind. I took this past week, I come up here to do some work in the church, and I took my little boy, Lincoln Maverick, full of life, and I tell you, he had never been in the back of the church area here. And we walked up, if you've ever been in the bab baptistry area, we walked up them steps, and we come, and he walked around, and there's a curtain right here. And the curtain, he, he looked and I said, do you want to go down in this? Well, you can imagine a three-year-old boy, what would he say? Yeah. Oh yeah, if I was three and my daddy was the preacher, I'd want to go into it too. We walked in there. <laughs> and with all humility today, I will tell you this, I looked at him, I said, son, one day, you might not get what I'm saying right now. But one day, there might be a day that you're standing right in this very spot. And because of your commitment to Jesus Christ, I said, there'll be water in here. And he was like, oh, water? <laughs> and I will say, I baptize you, my son. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I said, you'll go under the water and come back up. And he acted like, oh, he was ready to do it. <laughs> you can do it too.